Welcome to the Kiwi and Yoko podcast. Today's guest is Brian Kest. Our aim here is to bring you subjects as best as we can without getting in the way too much as a host, so interviewees rather than interviewer. This doesn't always work out for the purposes of conducting a thought-provoking conversation, but I try my best to keep out of the way and fairly inconspicuous behind it all. Anyway, on the other hand, if you did want to listen to me being interviewed, I'm actually better being interviewed in a way is actually easier than being in the interviewer. So there are a number of opportunities to do so, and you can find me on Adam and Holly Hustlers, Honestly Unbalanced podcast, Defining Harmony podcast with Harmony Slater and Russell Arthur's case, as well as Jay Brown's um, Ubiquitous podcast. This podcast is an offering to the yoga community to help support and inspire all our practices, even mine as well. You know, it's really helped me. On the other hand, we do accept donations, so head on over to Kieran Yoga if you fancy that as well as review us on iTunes. So as I mentioned, today's guest is Brian Kest, perhaps, although as we shall discuss, debatably the inventor of the term power yoga, along with probably the roots of a vinyasa yoga, which is a was an amended Ashtanga practice, though now it's become something of its own. So he really is an innovator and at the very start of the whole thing, really, as yoga came to its modern form. So the podcast is really interesting and unique um, essentially an Ashtanga podcast, but despite being grateful for his original training, first from David Williams and then an extended stay, often one-to-one in the late 80s with Batavi Joyce himself, Brian is pretty outspoken in his critique, a pretty vehement critique of Ashtanga yoga, actually. <laughs> Although you may notice that at some points I kept silent, I do agree on many of the issues he brought up, and to this end I feel the podcast is not a complete diatribe against Ashtanga as some of his views are actually really useful to incorporate into our own practice, albeit still enthusiastically, I am, and probably you are, Ashtanga. So Brian talks of the early days, injuries, overpushing, ego, and the gradual wear and tear of our bodies in the most distinct and entertaining manner as he does. It's a very practical and reasonable take he actually presents, on many accounts, with his aim of yoga to increase the benevolence, he says, and decrease the malevolence. Brilliant and catchy. Increase the benevolent and decrease the malevolent. So a really fun podcast and an effective yoga view as it relates to everyday life. Really, he is very practical again. Even if we might not disagree, agree or disagree with it all, it's well worth hearing him out and considering his point of view fully. So without further ado, I welcome Brian to the Kiri Yoga Podcast. So, today's guest on the Kiwi Yoga Podcast is Brian Kest. Um, welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, all right, so we haven't chatted too much before the podcast. Can you give us a brief overview of how you, how you got into yoga? Um, you, you gave me a couple of ideas, uh, who your teacher was, and uh, the fact that our, te- our basis of listeners is Ashtanga Yoga. Maybe you could chat about your experiences in India with Patavi Joyce. Sure, man. I will answer any question that you'd like. Um, uh, I got into it when I was, I started when I was uh, about 14 or 15 years old, when uh, my father gave me the choice of to doing yoga or leaving the home. So uh, I yeah, before, wasn't that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That is crazy. But, yeah, he, yeah. you know, he was passionate about it and he knew yeah that we wouldn't do it um, if he didn't force us to do it. So uh, that was the situation. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend that to other parents, but uh, it turned out, <laughs> turned out good in this particular situation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he was, and, he was a, and as I understood, he was a surgeon who had healed his back or at least his helped his back problems with yoga through yoga, right? Um, yes. And no, he was a surgeon. He didn't heal his back through yoga, but um, I, when he, he, when he was turned on to yoga as maybe, you know, Ashtanga is probably not going to heal your back, but, um, you mm, know, due to its violence enough. and its ag- aggressiveness <laughs> yeah. and all that and, and all the forward bends and all that stuff. But, um, 
especially back then, you know, when we had the intensity of people forcing mm. people deeper mm. into poses. But um, the the wonderful thing about all yoga is the how it affects your stress level. And, you know, stress alone can ha- be a big factor in back problems and just a, a big factor in people's overall health. And, um, you know, when he was doing the yoga, and as we all know, when we're done with a yoga practice, whether it's a shtanga or any type of yoga, how we feel so peaceful, um, you know, he, he really felt like he wanted his children to have that feeling. Mm. And um, he he was a very strong. And back then we didn't have a choice, right? Because where we that there wasn't a lot of yoga available back in yeah. the seventies, um, and Ashtanga yoga was what was happening in that time where we were, um, and we didn't really know anything different. And plus, you know, even though it was very aggressive, um, we liked it because we were very aggressive. So yeah. we, you <laughs> yeah. know, we found a yeah. yoga that that fit our mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, and your dad was te- your dad was learning Ashtanga yoga, was he? And he turned you onto that, or did you go and find that on your own? Yeah, we were in the first Ashtanga class in the entire world outside of India, which was when David Williams brought the Ashtanga yoga class to the United States. Right. So yeah, as I understood, David Williams was your pr- primary and first teacher, right? He was my very he, uh, him and uh, another man named Brad Ramsey. They were kind of okay. like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a teaching duel. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think um, Brad passed away a few years ago. Um, so how did, how did that transpire? Uh, how I mean, what, what were your first experiences of the Ashtanga? Um, and then how did you go to Mysore? Because you told me you, you spent a year living with Patabi Joyce in Mysore. Yeah, um, you know, I had a, you know, I had a really um, powerful experience myself with the the yoga you know I mean I really resonated with it it really made a lot of sense to me and it really made me feel good and you know it really fed my ego too which was a big part Mm -hmm. of my life back then because it was so aggressive and it did have such a a wonderful sculpting effect on my body um, that you know I was very and it made a lot of sense right because you know you can't take care of something you don't touch and you know, a well-rounded yoga practice, especially in a Stanga yoga sequence, you know, it touches so much mm, mm. Um, that it, it just made a lot of sense to me. And, you know, what eventually I wanted to, I wanted to smell the smell of yoga and taste the taste of yoga and feel its essence. You know, I felt like it was a little bit hypocritical of me to be teaching yoga, having not visited India and, you know, got the yoga from India myself. So mm. um, I don't, I don't want any more feel that way. I don't feel like you have to travel there. You know, it's, it, it's a nice thing to do. It's a powerful thing to do. It's, it, it, it really is an awakening thing to do, but I don't think it's necessary. But back then I did think it was necessary. So, mm. you know, I asked David where, you know, I asked him if I could go study with his teacher, who was um, the person who created Ashtanga yoga. His name was Patabi Joyce. And uh, David gave me the protocol, which was basically writing him a letter and asking permission, and which I did. And he he said I could. Patabi said I could come, and um, you know, I I ventured out there and lived with him. Well, uh, just backing up a minute, where did you meet? You didn't go to Hawaii. Was David uh, in Hawaii, or was that before they were traveling around Brad and him and and doing workshops elsewhere? No, what happened was, is David brought Ashtanga yoga to Encinitas, California. Right, okay. That was at that time. That was the right. first Ashtanga class mm. on earth, basically, outside of it's, India. You were there in Encinitas? No, 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 no. Then okay. he disbanded that class and, and reignited it on Maui, and that's where I was. Okay, okay, right, yeah. So we've had David on the podcast and kind of, have you read his book, by the way? He's, he's written a book recently. My journey with yoga. Definitely, I, I loved his book. It was uh, yeah, yeah. I think you, know, you must I, be. I think you're sure you mentioned it in some way. He does. He does mention you. He's mentioned you to me before. Yeah, I mean, he talks about me all the time. You know, I'm the godfather <laughs> of his son, and um, you know, we're we're very close. Our families have always been close. Um, but he doesn't mention me in the book because the book ends before he meets me. Okay. Right. For shame, yeah, he's an amazing guy. Um, so what, what, what? I mean, okay, going forward again. So how are your experiences? I mean, you know, we're in Ashtanga listenership, as I said. How are your experiences with Patabi Joyce? And you mentioned at the time the yoga was, it was framed different to today. It was a lot more, ah, 
for want of a better word, aggressive. There was a lot more pushing. There was a lot more demand to get into the postures and increase them to the nth degree. Um, was that your experience in, in Mysore? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was highly aggressive. It really, looking back on it, it was insane and cultic. <laughs> I should laugh really, but, but yeah. I mean, <laughs> but you know, sometimes, yeah. sometimes that's what you have to go through to come out of that. You know, it's like, you know, yeah, it, right. sometimes you need to be injured to wake up to see yeah. that, you know, there's something wrong with what you're doing. So I, I really value my experience there. You know, I, I always feel grateful for, you know, the lessons Patabi gave me, you know, the, I always tell people what I learned most about Pata, from Patabi was everything I never want to be as a yoga instructor. <laughs> But you were, you said you were there on your own, like so. It was just you and him. On what year was that? Just you and him in the room as a student, you know, one to one. I I believe that was nineteen eighty eight. Bloody hell! Right. And so some of that period you you just spent with him. Practicing well, when alone. I got there, when I yeah. got there, me, I when I there when I got there, nobody was there. Yeah. Nobody. There was not one student there, um, and I, I practiced with him. For, oh, I travel with a friend, so me and my friend practice with him, although uh, my friend was incessantly injured because of the aggressiveness, and he was a little bit more fragile than me, so he didn't practice a lot. He was more recuperating, and eventually he thought it was insane immediately, and he left. Um, took me I was a little more hard-headed. It took me a little longer to figure out the insanity of it all, but um, so it, it was me and Patabi, and uh, eventually, after a, a few months, you know, there was a trickle of students um, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that that started coming into there and from all over the world. And, uh, what, you what know, was, by the time I left to, to renew my visa, there was probably eight people there. What was the insanity about it? I mean, and what was the cultishness? Um, you know, it's, it's multifaceted. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, the 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 hyper aggressiveness, you know, when you're people's bodies are screaming stop from pain and they're pushing you deeper um that alone is insane right i mean the reason you have pain is to protect you not you know not yeah, to disregard right. um mm -hmm. that alone was one of the insanities about it the the other insanity about it i mean there was it was a there was a lot of things you know there was a lot of um of of mannerisms of patabi that we could get into or we don't have to get into that no, you can also, speak as you want here yeah yeah Absolutely. Yeah, but there's a there's just a lot of stuff that um didn't make sense. And also when you got injured, the mentality was that's an opening. It's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it and if you, and that's one that, why I said it's kind of cultish because you know, I mean to 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 believe that, you know, to be, go against any kind of rational or or sane mentality and believe something. <laughs> Um, like that is, you know, it's kind of like religion, yeah. right? Like you, yeah, just, reinforced by a group dynamic, yeah, which is, you know, yeah. kind of completely dissonant to reality. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, yeah. and uh, you were injured, were you? Oh yeah, I was seriously injured on uh, multiple occasions. In what? In what postures? How? Well, there was one time, if you could imagine, there's a uh, there's a pose called Ekapada Sirsasana, which is Ekapada yeah. means one leg and Sirsasana. Yeah, leg behind the head. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, you're sitting there and I'm sitting there with one leg extended out in front of me and the other leg behind my head. And Patabi came up behind me and took the leg that was behind my head and pulled it down to the middle of my back. Mm, okay. Um, mm. and, and my back snapped. It's literally snapped. And I, I crawled out of there and I spent three weeks in bed. And again, this, you know, there's no apology. There's no learning from this kind of violence. And it, it is considered an opening. And, you know, and me, I, I bought into it all. And I was back there the next day. Uh, I mean, three weeks later and, uh, um, oh you know, at it, at it again. <laughs> right. Oh, God, that is crazy, isn't it? In fact, I mean, Chuck Miller told me the same. He had an adjustment in Dwee Padishish Asana where the same uh, legs were pulled far down, you know, like not into the posture, but far out of Dwee Pada, you know, much deeper than that. And um, yeah, he, he he also said he hadn't really ever recovered from that, which I'm sure he'd be yeah, happy to have on the record. Is, Dewey, yeah. Dewey Pada and Ekapada mean Sir Sassan, yeah. I mean leg yeah. behind leg head. Behind, not leg behind back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I probably shouldn't let this conversation go on being an Ashtanga podcast, but you know, they were, they, they were the time. So uh, anyway, what, what, what made you, I see, see you know, you, you developed from this experience and then, you, you know, you're well known for I, I'm almost, I, I don't think you, did you coin, was it Beryl Bender that coined power yoga or was it you? Well, uh, I coined it, um, but uh, she claims that she coined it. So uh, I, I don't know if she copied me and she's lying some about it. Some kind of trademark or, issues going on here. Yeah. Well, there's no trademark issue. She tried to do it, but she couldn't do it because she couldn't prove that she um, she coined it. And, uh, and you know, there, there is the possibility that two people at the same time thought of the same name. I mean, I didn't even think of it. I was giving a private lesson and uh, – um, the person that I was giving a private lesson to was actually the one who said, you should call this power yoga. And I said, yeah, that's a great name. And I had been using it for years. And then I had heard that um, someone on the East Coast was using it. And, you know, I, I, I didn't care. I mean, she was on the East Coast. But then I got a letter from her lawyer asking me to cease and desist, which I thought was. Really? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, which was really crazy because I, that was my first interaction with like the business world, right? Like I thought, hey, yeah. we're all yogis. Why doesn't she just call me? Yeah. Why doesn't she just call me and talk to me? Well, years later, she apologized and told me that her her lawyer made her do it. So, um, you know. We're, we're, me and her are, um, we don't talk a lot. We don't, we never had a friendship. You know, we're living in, uh, in 2000 miles apart, but, um, you know, we've, we've, we, we, you know, we put all that has been brushed aside and, um, you know, right everything now. she's doing seems to be cool. The thing is the difference though is, is, is that she doesn't teach power yoga. She teaches Ashtanga yoga, but she calls it power yoga, <laughs> right, okay. which is, so, which is very yeah. different. And the reason she does, did that was is yeah, because yeah. she thought the, the word Ashtanga would yes, um, yeah. would be too esoteric for the Americans. So she changed the name to Power Yoga, but she's really teaching uh, classical Ashtanga Yoga in the is book she? that she calls Power Yoga. It's Ashtanga, isn't it, more or less? Yeah. So what is? I mean, if you, like, let's let's get on to what is Power Yoga for you then? What? Why did you change the Ashtanga Yoga, and how did you differentiate it from Ashtanga to Power? What What does Power mean? Power means something that's empowering. Okay, that's nice. Right, right? and mm-hmm. you, you, it, it, and that's the way you feel when you're done with the yoga practice, right? You feel empowered. It's it's very special. It's a very powerful tool towards well being. So, you know, an empower yoga doesn't flow off your lips as smoothly as power yoga. So. Um, I liked it when my client, you know, suggested, you know, or just just whimsically came up with it. You know, mm-hmm. I just I thought, wow, that's a great name. Um, but I'm not a business person. You know, I never uh, trademarked it, and um, I, I didn't care to do any of that stuff. And uh, I still not a good, you know, I still don't, you know, I, I still don't like um, indulging in in the business world more than I have to. So you know, um. You know, that's why when I started teaching yoga, I did it on donation basis. You know, I just put the money in the box and whatever's there is mine. I think David you know, Williams and, did the same thing. What's that? I think David Williams did the same thing when he started. It was a, and famously, it was something like, if you come to class every day, you don't have to pay at all. And every day you miss, you, get, you know, fees go up. Something like that. No, no, no that's not true at all. No, it's a, it's a myth, no. is it? He did it. Yeah. That's close. What he did is, is, is he, you had to pay. And you had to pay, uh, you know, I was in that first class. I remember because my dad was paying a lot of money because there was six of us, right? There are my brothers and his wife. I mean, there was a lot of us in the class. So yeah, right. he was paying 200 a month. He was paying 1200 a month. But, um, but David said, if you miss a day, you cannot come back and you lose your money. Okay. Right. Right. That's pretty tough, isn't it? But he was because David was asking you to be serious about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, he was asking you to be serious about it. So, um, anyways, uh, you know, so power yoga was basically see what we all need to do, and Patabi did this too, right? We all need we need to take 
a generic version of anything and we need to um, we need to personalize it so it it works for our uniqueness because we're all unique we're not all supposed to do the exact same thing you know we're not all supposed to eat the exact same food mm-hmm. in the exact same quantity right we're not all supposed to dress the exact same way we're not all supposed to follow the exact same religion you know we all need to per- take these ideas and then you know add our own personal touch to it to make it ours right so all i did and i did it in india in front of patabi and he never had a problem with it i was going to say were you seeing individualization from patabi just at that point amongst different people no patabi did individualize it amongst different people but patabi individualized it because he taught completely different than his teacher right okay so patabi taught different than his teacher in other words patabi took something from his teacher and he personalized it and um and you know when i was in india now you know because the the, the shtanga is very limiting right i mean you're you're stuck on um you're stuck on these particular poses that are housed within these particular sequences and there's really no no you're not allowed to do anything else and yeah. so what I, you know, I would be in the, in the middle of a sequence, like I would be in a, a, a like, a, a, what is it? A spread leg forward bend. Um, and, yeah, uh, Vista? Upta, no, but standing spread leg forward bend. Um, Upta Vista is sitting, but I would be in the standing, which is in the standing series of the Ashtanga. Yeah, the Pasaritas. Um, it's called, it's called Parzarita Padatanasana. And yeah. I would be in the middle of Parzarita Padatanasana. <laughs> and, and. And um, at the end of the four, you know, there's an A, B, yeah, C, yeah. and D, right? At the end of the four, for me, it was very natural to go into splits, right? Because you're not going to get splits in any other, in any other, any other time in first series, second series, third series. You're not going to get, you know, you can get uh, the the um. The, the forward backward splits but you're not going to yeah. get the side splits so right, okay. you know f- for me it was really natural and an opportunity to go right into splits and then from splits i would put my palms on the ground and press into a handstand and then from handstand i would press back down to spread leg forward bend and i'd continue the sequence and i mm. did that right right in front of patabi and, and he never said a word about it you know, we also put a hand, we also did full vinyasa, which means, you know, we did a, a salutation between each and every pose, and we did a half a salutation in between each side of poses. And yeah. I would press into handstand with each vinyasa. So I would lift up and press into handstand and then drop into chaturanga and then do my cobra and then down dog, you know, or the up dog and then down dog and then jump into the next pose. Hmm. Right. And we would do a full handstand. I mean, not we, me, and there was one other great Ashtangi back then named Graham Northfield, um, oh, yeah, who was De- yeah. who was Dean of Kingsborough's for Kingsburg's first teacher, and um, I think you interviewed Dina. I have, yeah, yeah, I have yeah. Graham. Well, yeah. Dina's do, first teacher yeah, yeah. was Graham, and right? Yeah, I think me and Graham were the only ones doing that. But Patabi watched the whole thing, and um, you know, he never he never commented on it, so. Um, you know, he was allowing us to basically personalize it. And then all power yoga is, is basically a, a stupid name, right? And b- back in the day, I thought it was a cool name because it was very empowering. But now I think it's a stupid name because I feel like when people hear that name, it intimidates them and I don't want to intimidate anybody. Yeah, I guess I see. I, I assumed it was just all the hardest stuff and all the kind of most physical no, stuff no, no, taken and put into it. That's, Right, right, right. So what, I mean, what is your attitude towards vinyasa and breath then that differentiates the how you teach? Well, the thing is, is, is that you want, you don't want to alienate people. See, like 1% mm, mm. of the people in the world are going to ever be able to do even first series. You know, and, and so, you know, and, and also first series doesn't give you any options. Like you got an hour and a half practice and that's it. Right. So you're going to have very few people in the world ever be able to do that because their bodies aren't going to be comfortable doing a lot of those poses, like even something like uh, um, uh, uh, that half lotus forward bend with your arm Mm. wrapped around your back, Mm. you know. uh, So, you know, I mean, it's it's you're going to it's just not doable for 99.99% of the people and you're not allowed to alter it you know because as soon as you do it's no longer ashtanga yoga 
right? Mm, like, and mm. not, now it's basically power yoga or it's, mm. you know, whatever, you know, vinyasa yoga or flow yoga. All those yogas are simply Ashtanga yoga modified. You know, so all, Ashtanga yoga was like the very first vinyasa yoga class. And then what everybody did is they took this idea of flowing yoga, vinyasa yoga, and they did what they wanted to it. And in the beginning, um, you know, it was considered a perversion of Ashtanga. Although now you'll never hear that. Now it's an accepted way to practice. It's like it's like Jesus, you know, was considered a per perversion of Judaism, or Bruce Lee was considered a perversion of Kung Fu. Yeah. You know, these people had to go through all this tremendous criticism before their mythology was accepted. Um, you know, and so, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa was even criticized for doing what she did. <laughs> And Gandhi, you know, I mean, it's like all these great beings like break away from the dogma and and bring new ideas in. And originally they're criticized by their, you know, their their um their predecessors. Um, but eventually what they do is 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 embraced and as and worshipped as innovation. And it's the same thing that, you know, what happened with Ashtanga, you know, I mean, people changed. I mean, there's a big article in a, a yoga journal, which I still have, which totally criticizes me for what I'm doing, right? They say, oh, uh, you know, it's a perversion of Ashtanga yoga. Um, and and now there's not one person in that is that started with me in Ashtanga yoga that's still doing Ashtanga yoga. Right, right, right. What is your what is your perversion? How do you pervert the system, and and why? Because you've got some interesting ideas about you know. Um, it's how to, not how perverted. To, how to but it's not perverted right. at all. But the perversion is simply altering yeah. it to fit my uniqueness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah, like I really was being facetious. And like, how did you? How and why did you change the system? And 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 how did you structure that? What's your what were your kind of aims in in your teaching and the way you taught? Because. You know, you know, I, I, we, like I said, we're all different, you know, and it's like, it's why should you eat the same quantity of food as me? Mm. Right. Why should you eat the same quantity of food as me? And, you know, why should you eat at the same times as me? And why should you eat exactly what I eat? It's, it's based, remember, we talked about the cultishness of it. It's big. And by the way, Ashtanga is not the only yoga or religion or spiritual practice um, that demands, um, uh, ad ad adherence to the dogma that's what it is now we you know we've all come a lot of us have come out of that now you know but um initially there there was this it was almost like this 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 kind of misguided idea that existed throughout millennia that the teacher knows and the student doesn't know hmm. right and so the idea was is you blindly follow the teacher even if the teacher is wrong you blindly follow the teacher. That's the way it worked back then. You know, the guru was the boss and the student had to, had to listen. And, you know, I went through that and I, and I realized that wasn't working for me. And, and then, then what I realized is, is, is that the teacher doesn't know, the student knows, because it's impossible for the teacher to ever understand what the student's experience is, because the teacher doesn't have the student's genetic lineage and life experiences that have created the student's experience. So all a teacher can ever do, and that's why you hear me use the word instructor and not teacher, mm. right? All the teacher or the instructor can ever do is share with the student what they like and then empower the student to make their own decision because yoga is supposed to be empowering. It's not so supposed it, to take away your power, right? In a so class, people, then, are you allowing other people to? Are you allowing people to change the, um, and modify their own sequences in, in your class? Yeah, what what we do is we empower students to find where they belong in each pose and to discard any of the poses that they feel are inappropriate for them. Because you know, what if someone has an injury? You know, you it would mm. be insane to expect. And we all have injuries, and and we all have genetic things that might be inappropriate for us like a lot of people have you know would be in a, inappropriate for them to do a handstand because of the the, the size of their wrist what about what about, the, their wrist. My, what about the, my, all the lotus stuff the the, the early early in the series you've got a lot of lotus a lot of lotus stuff right in the standing very quickly in the seated sequence what do you do with that 
Well, I'm sure David Lotus. Williams told you about what happened to his knees because of all the, the the Lotus stuff. You know, he'd be he'd be walking down the street and his knees would pop out of joint because the tendons got hyper flexible. Hmm. Right. I mean, it was put it this way. You know, I, I, there's nothing wrong with any type of yoga in the world. What's wrong is how people approach it. Right. If you approach it in an aggressive way, it's going to be damaging. And if you approach it in a gentle way, it's going to be healing, right? So, you know, it, you can do, if you allow people to do half lotus to the degree that feels right on their body, right? So for some people, half lotus won't be half lotus. It will be more like John Yushar Shasana. Yeah, yeah. But how do you encourage that feeling in a class? I mean, it's because people, you know, inevitably, oh, you and, just still, and still now, you just people, people, still, you say, people still okay. want to push, right? I mean, people naturally still want to push themselves, right? So how do you encourage, like, uh, you know, a different approach in your classes towards you the asset? Right right? you, all you do right. is you speak to it, but you have to understand that mm. you can't control people's actions. So you can't stop someone from being aggressive, but you can share with them the insanity of being aggressive. So how do you say that? Just like well, that. You say that <laughs> it's, you, it's, it's insane. <laughs> Don't do that. Well, you can say it as simply as which person over 30 years old hasn't figured out that the harder you are in anything, the faster you destroy it. There's nothing in the world that doesn't fall under the law that the harder you are on it, the faster you destroy it. So it doesn't make sense to push hard if you want your body to last as long as possible and feel as good as possible. I think this is segueing on to an interesting point I thought you brought up in another interview, another podcast interview I listened to, which was that you mentioned doing less and actually being more healthy for the body. Uh, you give the example of Ronaldo being actually a, a, having a very unhealthy body, right? Like, whereas the, the figures that we assume to be in super health are actually way over. So they're, they're kind of decimated. Uh, you use the example of a car. They're kind of running their car into the ground, right? Rather than, you know, parking it in the garage like a little old lady and just taking oh, it out for a ride now and again. Here's the yeah. example. If you go to buy a used car, who do you want to buy the used car from? That, you, that want to, exactly. you want to buy yeah. the used car from the little old lady from Pasadena because Pasadena, yeah. California <laughs> has no humidity in the air, right? So the metal really? will right. never rust. And okay. the little old lady, she barely drove her car. And when she did, she drove slow and careful. So the car is 30 years old, but it's like getting a brand new car. The last thing you'd ever want to do is buy a, uh, a used car from a taxi driver in New York City. There must be a happy medium whereby, you know, because you don't use the thing at all, right? That, you know, that's not good. But the but little lady de- does use it. She does use right. it. That's okay. why, Adam, the healthiest exercise in the world is called yeah. walking. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose then, is that what you do for your practice? I just got back from a two-hour walk just now. <laughs> what about your arms or the rest of your torso? I, you know, I feel great. You know, I feel really, really good when I'm walking. I move my arms. I move my torso. I'm not at, I'm not, um, I'm not adverse to, um, doing upper body and lower body stretches very, very gently. Listen, right. there's, there's nobody my age doing Ashtanga yoga. It's, it, it'll, it's, it's ultimately damaging. It's all, especially, you me especially if you're aggressive. Now, yeah. if you're hyper gentle, that's mm. fine. But then if okay. you're hyper gentle, it's no longer going to be Ashtanga because, um, mm. you know, some right. poses are going to be have to be skipped and some poses are going to have to be modified. Like for me, uh, all the, you know, the full upper forward bending in the vin- doing vinyasas and all that actually became damaging for my spine. You know, it at, after I cooled down, I couldn't move because uh, of, you know, my, my, my yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's everything has to be modified. Mm. Was that when you were young, or I mean, I, you, you know, how uh, at what age did you start finding that it needs to modify and and tone it down a bit? Um, well, I started modifying when I was practicing with Patabi. You know, like I told you, I started adding things okay. that I wanted to do. But that was tough. Um, you know, that was kind of a tough modification, rather than you know the opposite way around, right? Like just kind of make you know, kind of like. 
gentrifying it, as, as it were. Yeah, that was the, definitely a tough modification. But what it did is it started me. It was me taking permission to do what okay. I wanted to do, rather than yeah. blindly mm. following the dogma. And by the yeah. way, you know, Ashtanga Yoga was created by Patabi. It's not like it's this ancient yoga. Yeah, it's like there, there's no history to a, a Ashtanga Yoga. Patabi's teacher didn't teach it. And 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 this and Patavi never really did it, right? No one's ever in ever in the history of of Ashtanga history ever seen Patavi practice, right? Oh, David that's, Williams, yeah. David yeah. Williams, who was the first person to practice with them, along with uh, this other guy from the Big Island of Hawaii. See, David was the second Westerner. He was just the first Westerner to bring it to the United States. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Patabi never practiced even when David was there in the late 60s or early 70s. Right? That's and, true. That's true. And yeah, people yeah. said, people, you know, the Ashtangis like to say yeah. that the reason Patabi didn't practice was because he was punishing himself because of his mm. child suicide. <laughs> right? But yeah, David, that, that was a... Yeah, David that was before was that. Yeah, yeah. David true. was friends with yeah. the child before the child committed suicide, and David said, "But Tabi still wasn't practicing before then." No, Ramesh was an adult. He was teaching, in fact, at the time. Um, yeah. uh, you know, he was actually teaching David. Um, so no, there's no history to. Uh, but, I'm not criticizing it. You know, no, if no, you no, like no. it, then you should go for it. <laughs> but let's not pretend that this is some kind of ancient tradition. You know, supposedly Ashtanga comes from a. a a manuscript called the Yoga Karenta that no one on earth has ever seen. And, and you know, Jorge Furistein, who wrote the complete book of yoga, which is basically considered that, you know, he was a he was a scholar who researched yoga, you know, yeah, in yeah. the book basically says that no one's ever seen this, you know, Yoga Karenta. So, you know, we're talking about something that Patabi made up, which is beautiful. But if Patabi makes it up, why can't I? <laughs> well, and why I can't you, so, Adam, I love, you know? Along those lines, why is it you're saying that you're going for a walk and not doing yoga? Are the two things different or is it simply a body discipline? I mean, because you're quite practical in the way that you view, you know, the relation to the body in terms of going out into the world and making some use in the world, right? It, 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 it doesn't seem like it's a, a particularly esoteric idea in terms of something, kind of some kind of inner transformation within the postures and the breath and in an alchemical, alchemical sense. Right? Well, first of all, I never said I don't do yoga. I just said I came back from a two-hour walk. So that's number one. But number two is, is, is that yoga is not a physical practice. There's no correlation between anything you could ever do physically and yoga. You got to understand that yoga. You know, if you go to India, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all of yoga in India has nothing to do with physical practice. It has to do yeah. with devotional practices and meditation practices. Mm -hmm. That what makes physical yoga yoga is the the meditation mind that you bring into the physical exercise. When you bring the quality of meditation into physical exercise, that becomes yoga asana. But without the meditation quality, which Patabi never taught, it's not yoga. It's just Eastern calisthenics. There's nothing inherent in the movements themselves that you think are particularly particularly profound or significant you could do the same of thing walking not. there or of playing not. football they have the same movements in gymnastics they have the same movements in martial arts they have the same movements in dance they have the same movements in capoeira capoeira i mean you can find similar movements in all sorts of physical activities in calisthenics what makes yoga yoga is not the movement what makes yoga yoga is the quality of mind that's performing the movement. And if you can bring that quality of mind into anything, right, then that thing is called yoga practice. So you can bring it into walking. You can bring it into running. You can bring it into, um, you know, these yoga poses. You can bring it into anything. Because what yoga is really is the cultivation of awareness. And if you're trying to do yoga and, you know, the yoga poses um, with awareness, then they become yoga asana. Because you have to understand, you know what asana means, right? Hmm. So we, I suppose in 
Has it shifted for you then? Because you say in the early days you were doing it for the ego because it made you look good because, you know, the sculpted body. And then gradually the postures or the, the mindset or how does that shift for you into the idea that you're doing yoga for something different now? You're doing it for awareness. Well, no, I was doing yoga back then for the same reason I'm doing it now. I was doing it for mm, the reasons okay. of wellness, for reasons right. of wellness. It's mm, just mm. that back then my ego was much bigger. Right. <laughs> That's all. And so okay. I, when, I, when I saw the results of the aggressive yoga on my body, I was happy because, you know, the aggressive yoga made my body incredibly muscularly defined. Yeah. Right yeah. now, but, but I thought back then that looking muscularly defined meant that I was healthy. Now I realize that's wrong because in order to get muscularly defined, Usually, you know, some people are genetically predisposed to it, but most of us, in order to do that, we have to beat the shit out of our bodies. And remember, mm. the harder you are on anything, the faster you destroy it, whether it's your car, your marriage, or your body. That's <laughs> why I say, that's why I say athletes turn out more messed up than the average person because athletes beat the shit out of their body. Do you have, do you to find it? Did you find do you find the same thing then? Having done that when you were young, are you paying the price now, or did you get off? Lucky? Everybody, every, yeah, I everybody pays the price in their fifties and sixties for what they did to their bodies in their twenties and thirties. No, everybody, because remember, again, it's a universal law. The harder you are in anything, the faster you destroy it. So what happens is, is things get worn out, and that's another thing with Ashtanga is the repetitive movement. What you're actually doing, if you're doing the same thing every day, is you're really wearing those things out. So what happens is, is in the beginning, you like the results because you're getting looser, which is also crazy because there's never been any proof on earth that looser people are healthier and happier people. But for some reason, you know, people want to get more flexible, um, just like they want to get stronger and just like they want to get prettier and just like they want to stay younger. Mm. Because we, this is called the rat race being brought into your yoga practice, right? Um, because we all want to get somewhere. You know, we, if you're in a forward bend and you want to go deeper in the forward bend, you know, and, and you know, you had addressed that earlier when you were asking me, people in my class that are pushing hard mm. because mm. it happens all the time. I mean, if you're in a forward bend, most people think they're making progress when they can go deeper in the forward bend. So how do you structure a different approach then? Because I, mean, I was interested in when you were talking more recently in, a, in another podcast again about avoiding the pitfalls of competition and comparison in classes. And, and, you know, as much as we're trying to do yoga for awareness, oftentimes the class, that seems to creep in and cloud a lot of that possibility. You know, you're in a class full of people, especially in Ashtanga, doing the same thing. And um, it tends to go in the opposite direction from awareness to, to something else again. How, how, do you, how do you cultivate that that um aim for awareness listen all you can do is you can plant seeds in your class participants mind when those seeds um start to sprout and flower um is going to be different for every person you know some people will have to damage themselves severely before they start to hear what i'm saying you know, some people right away, they're like, oh, my God, Brian, you're so right. I never thought about that. The harder you are at anything, the faster you destroy it. Why am I pushing so hard? That's why the healthiest exercise on earth is called walking, because it's also the most gentle exercise on earth. You know, my my mom just my mom was saying to me, she's saying she was saying, Brian, it's so weird. I never exercised my whole life. I'm 83 years old. You know, my girlfriend is 83. She never exercised. Um, my my best friend is 101. You know, she never exercised. And all of us are completely pain free. But everybody I know that spent their life exercising is in complete pain. Oh, God. Yeah, that is a little ironic, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's, it's ironic, <laughs> but, you know, see, we're brainwashed. We're, see, there's a universal law that says, it's a psychological law that says the more you see something, the more you believe it, even if it's insane. And in the West, we've grown up with these ideas, no pain, no gain, more is better, right? We, that's all we've ever seen. So even though it's illogical, 
we believe it. And then we bring that into our exercises and we enact it in our exercise, even though it's completely nonsensical. Remember uh, what's the your, little what's... old lady from Pasadena, she did drive her car. She d just didn't drive it aggressively or excessively. So it's not, it sounds like power yoga is now kind of, kind of the opposite, really, like a kind of like, well, imaginary remember, class. I told you in the beginning. I told you, I, what I learned from Patabi is everything I never want to be. Now, that <laughs> also goes with the, 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 the money trip that he, that he laid on people. That goes with the aggressive, physical aggressiveness that he laid on people. It also goes with the dogma that he laid on people. You know, I spent, I spent a month in his class where he sat on his stool and read the newspaper the whole class. He didn't even look at any of us. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's these are, you know, if I'm going to be leading someone, then I want to be involved with them. I want to be paying attention to their breath to make sure that they're not straining. Because as soon as you start to strain, you're being counterproductive. Because nobody comes to yoga to build tension and strengthen their reactiveness. And, you know, and, and if you're going to be aggressive, you're going to be straining, you know, so. You know, this is what I'm sharing with you, Adam, and it's so crazy, right, is I'm just sharing with you the most commonsensical, rational stuff. And, and but yet yeah, yeah, we've yeah. been all programmed by our culture that we can't see it. Do you think the attitudes in yoga and the yoga world, industry, whatever you want to call it, are changing? Do you think that's, or do you, do you think it's going on I the same know, as it ever did? because I'm not involved in it anymore. Right. Hmm. You know, I just do my own thing. I share the lessons I've learned. I share what makes sense to me, you know, and, and also, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly learning and evolving. And, you know, you know, if you talk to me in 20 years, I might, I might tell you something differently than I'm telling you now. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I see. And one thing I see is, is there's nothing esoteric in all of yoga. It's a very, very non-esoteric practice. It's, it's based in rationality and practicality. But, you know, we've all become so enamored with esotericism, you know, that, that we've taken it and turned it into something else. You know, it's not like you're going to stick your legs behind your head and Kundalini is going to start shooting up your asshole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I've heard you say that. And, and so you're using yoga quite practically and you talk about its practical uses in everyday life. You, you kind of feel that it should be the spotlight should be turned outwards from what one's doing on the mat to applying that. Right. Well, shouldn't, shouldn't, when you say practical, I mean, what you're saying is I'm doing yoga in a way that's, that makes sense. And shouldn't we do yoga in a way that makes sense? Should, should we actually do yoga in a way that doesn't make sense? I mean, is, should we have blind faith in anything? You know, because if you have blind faith in something and what you have faith in is wrong, then you just spent your whole life misleading yourself. Why don't you why don't you have faith in what you see to be true instead of something that you can't see to be true? What's the aim of yoga in your eyes? To strengthen the benevolent and eradicate the malevolent. Yeah, I like that definition. Nowadays you're teaching in person and online, I think. Yeah, we're teaching um, classes up here where I live, um, and uh, and then yeah, we have an online yoga studio, which um, and you've been doing that for thousands I mean, of classes. I know, I know. You, I, but I, but I heard that you've been doing that actually, like way before the pandemic started. So you're really a forerunner in that as well, right? Well, I've been doing it for ten years before the yeah, pandemic. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's crazy that you were just so early on in the online, and 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 you were skeptical at first, but you feel it works now. Well, I, I always thought it would work, but I was skeptical that, um, that, you know, the most powerful yoga lesson I ever got in my life actually came from a video. Right. Have you ever heard of Vipassana meditation? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, Vipassana, if you ever go do a Vipassana, oh, right. you're, you're going, going to get going all to, going the to video. Yeah, yeah, through yeah. a video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. All but right. So that was your inspiration. Powerful. Yeah, you're right. And by the way, that's where I started to understand yoga. And that's what started to help me inform my physical yoga was when I did my first Vipassana, because, you know, I started to 
develop that level of sensitivity that actually would can make a yoga pose healing. See, mm. yoga poses aren't healing on their own because, you know, you can do them in an aggressive and damaging way. What makes a yoga pose healing is when you're tuned in and you're honoring what it is that you're feeling, which is why you're given feelings to guide you, right? And I got that from Vipassana. I didn't get that from Ashtanga. Mm. Now, hopefully, there's a lot of Ashtanga teachers out there that are, you know, are, are, are becoming aware of this stuff and bringing this in. But by the way, if you're bringing this into Ashtanga, then it's no longer Ashtanga. It's just a name, isn't it? Yeah, because Ashtanga is basically what Patabi taught. And Patabi didn't teach that. So, Brian, I mean, come to about 50 minutes. Um, and you're teaching nowadays? What is it? What is it? I mean, you said it's individualized. It's probably more gentle than, than what I thought was power yoga. Or at least I think I saw you doing a video in the early 90s of power yoga, which, which was quite powerful. Um, it's still a very, very challenging class because okay. there's so many, but there's so many uh, types of people that take my class. So if I, how can uh, a young athletic person um, find their edge, not push past their edge, but how can they find their edge if the class doesn't challenge them? So what you have to do now is you have to create a, a challenging but approachable class. And then you have to encourage everybody in the class to see if they can find where they belong within it. So mm. let's say you're doing a, 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 a arm balance, like you're doing a, a handstand. Then some people will do a handstand without the wall. Some people will do a handstand with the wall. Some people may choose not to do it. And everybody is doing it perfectly because each person is taking that pose to their own degree. Mm. But if you don't do the challenging pose, then the people who are capable of it won't, will not be able to have that opportunity to stimulate themselves. Yeah. Well, shouldn't they be taking it back, really, you know, for later years? Are they, aren't they overusing the car? No, because as as the as their body changes, then they start taking it back, which okay. is also okay. something that Ashtanga doesn't give you permission to do. All right, so I usually end up the interview asking, "Give me an inspiration, something that inspires you. It could be a place, a book, a person, you know, anything, anything that inspires you, and and a guilty pleasure, or you know, something that you take pleasure in, something non yogic, or anything." <laughs> um, well, what I really encourage everybody to do, my greatest inspiration was yeah. Vipassana meditation. Okay. Okay. I, if, matter of fact, I will, I will take it to this degree. I will say, if you, if you don't do, if, if, if I hadn't done a Vipassana, I never would have understood yoga because Vipassana mm. opens you up to what yoga really is in the sense of um, meditation and developing awareness. Now, that's, that's when I traveled to India, that's what I saw. I saw yogis meditating and yogis indulged in devotional practices. I didn't see yogis doing asanas 99.999% yeah. of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So I really encourage people to do uh, a Vipassana meditation. And um, I don't have any guilty pleasure. <laughs> I feel I feel not guilty about anything. Yeah, I yeah, do. yeah. It's a silly question. David Swenson said the same. What's a pleasure? Give me a pleasure that's uh, perhaps uh, nonchalant. Uh, you know, doesn't mean uh, well, I mean, something you, know, you enjoy. A, a, ple a, a pleasure for me is my long walks, is making love with my my woman, um, you know, and pumpkin pie. <laughs> Pumpkin pie is pleasurable. <laughs> Just don't eat too much and don't eat too little, right? Moderate. And you know what's crazy, Adam? We can finish with this if you want, because I know yeah, you got sure. to go. Yeah. But, you know, the, if you think about it, gentleness, which is walking, right? Gentleness is just another word for moderation, right? right. And moderation yeah. was the teaching of the greatest yogi who ever walked on planet Earth. His name was Gotama the Buddha. 
Right. Now, that was his teaching. His teaching was called the middle path. Not too much, not too little. And if we all understood the concept of moderation, there'd be no such thing as global warming. That is a good and end note. I don't know what they're doing yeah. in Ashtanga Yoga these days, but when I was in Ashtanga Yoga, there was no such thing as moderation. Right. Mm. It was incredibly aggressive. So, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> From the start to the end, a damning uh, indictment of Ashtanga Yoga, but um, that's but, fine. <laughs> but it, you know, this is perfect for your podcast because it will bring a little balance to you know any of the other. Absolutely. Things. Again, um, that's Adam what I Connelly, wanted to give. I did Ashtanga yeah. for my first twelve years. I yeah. don't mean to be critical. I just mean to be honest. Yeah, um, and that's what I'm looking in the podcast. That's my aim. So fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on. Honestly. Mm.